three, two, one. Anthony Darby. Chuck Hen. Very special guest, Josh Crosney and Carrie Kirk. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you, Anthony. Yes, thank you for having us. Also the first time that we are putting two guests on one mic. And um, my assumption with this podcast is going to be a little sporadic is there's a lot of things that I want to get into. Um, these guys have a lot to contribute. They've both been in the cannabis industry for quite a long time. It's funny, I asked Carrie how long she's been at, at Caroline. You said four years. In most businesses, that seems like, oh, they're, you know, they've been here for a little while. But in the cannabis <laughs> industry, it's like, it oh, my it gosh. Like, it's dog years. Yeah. 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 Uh-huh. <laughs> And I met this guy the second day of my job. Uh-huh. And when I met her, I thought she, I was like, what are you, the CEO? And she's like, oh, I just started there today. <laughs> so, so how did you guys meet? And then give us both a little bit about how you guys got into the industry. So we originally met um, at, like, you know, Boo and Carissa and Megan at their events. Um, at the time, it was still Women Grow. And then they've since, you know, obviously launched into doing Spark. But, uh, yeah, we met there, and it was like. It was love at first sight. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, we'll do it individually. So you got hooked up with Canaline. Did you know someone at Canaline? Is that, or did you, did you get recruited to work for them? Or how'd you? I did. I was actually in the pharmacy industry. Um, I had worked in pharmacy for 17 years. And doing I've packaging always, or like? Um, no, actually doing um, pharmaceutical sales. And then I worked in a specialty pharmacy where um, it was kidney uh, dialysis and transplant patients. Um, And it's interesting because the pharmacy I worked for, they tested everybody, but they didn't didn't care about uh, cannabis. So if you tested positive for cannabis, and that's the only thing. And this was dating back like 20 years ago now. So they were they were were ahead of the time. Well, they would have to fire like like everybody. Everybody. Yeah. So. (laughs) (laughs) So, So, um, all right. So you're in the pharmaceutical industry, which is kind of a similar industry. And then so you get recruited from your current job. to. Yeah. So the pharmacist I work uh, with, Alyssa. Her uh, husband is one of the CEOs that started Andy Rickert, and Andy had been trying to get me um, on board, and then finally I submitted to his will, and I was like, yes. This is, but it was a good transition for me. It was a natural transition. Um, You've been a cannabis user for all your I life for a significant am. part. I'm high in church. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, working, and working in a pharmaceutical industry, at least where you were at least able, at least... You have one of the backgrounds, I've, one of the first times I've heard of someone who's actually like their employer knew that they were a cannabis user. A lot of times the employer, it's like either they know, but it's like a don't say don't anything. Don't ask, don't tell. Yeah, don't yeah. 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 Honestly, it's a lot of like that. Um, but it's kind of cool that your employer knew that. So it was an easy transition for you to get into the cannabis industry. And then for those folks that aren't aware, Canaline is one of the premier packaging and supply companies for the cannabis industry. Um, Harborside Health is one of like your, your big clients. And um, that was how I first came. I mean, we during our application stage, we were going to, um, I remember Elkridge and driving by, right, and grabbing the samples. I remember, there, I, honestly. Yeah. yeah. That it, it's I'm so desensitized to everything at this point now, but like that getting cannabis ago. sample it's packaging was like a huge deal. I remember yeah. opening up the yeah. tubs and getting the the sealed kits and like seeing the bags and stuff, and it was like almost one of our first like touches. Like this is a reality of like what could happen when we're because I, I met you guys pre application. Um, in DC, I in think, DC. wasn't it? Yeah, we met at a DC conference that uh-huh. we all went yeah, to. We all yeah. went to. Which again, it was the first time there was like free edibles. Oh, I yeah. was like, like fall yeah. around. <laughs> <laughs> um, so much fun. So. And Caroline, they do a great job. Uh, and they have a very open atmosphere there. It was like one of the first times I had a business meeting and a vape pen. I was like, uh, uh, the, the, the sentiment was, hey, if you need to use your vape pen, please don't worry about it. Yeah. Go ahead and, and, and use it away. I'm like, well, <laughs> this is a pretty stressful meeting picking up this cannabis packaging. So like, you got to tell me twice. <laughs> I, I better medicate. Just we got your bags. <laughs> we got your jars. <laughs> well, Carrie always said they have everything you need but the weed. Yes. Yeah. That's our unofficial <laughs> slogan. Yeah. unofficial slogan. I, I but like we got that, that at home. We so. got that at home, yeah. <laughs> So Josh, did did you get in, is the Cannabis Science Conference, was that your first footprint in the cannabis industry? So it is actually, and I, you know, I feel really lucky because, you know, it's obviously a very fluid industry and, you know, a lot of people, they transition, they, they're here, they're doing this, they're doing that. So I feel really lucky to still be doing the same thing that I um, did. But yeah, I, I um, came from staffing and recruiting for like the analytical science industry. And, um, you know, like Carrie, I've been a fan of cannabis for some time. <laughs> I would say since high school. I think that's what it was. But, um, 
But I really, you know, kind of start to look uh, behind the curtain and like go to shows in California and other places. And I realized that the science, the research and like the testing was like way not the way it should be. Um, so like, you know, for instance, in California at the time, they didn't require um, testing for the right. program. And it had been since the 90s that they've had medical there. And um, early on, I connected with Tracy Ryan with Canna Kids and I became on her board of Canna Kids. And, you know, this is a medicine at the end of the day and um, it should be safe. It should be tested. Obviously, cannabis itself is inherently safe, but even you have human error, contamination, all those mm -hmm. kind of things. Yeah, humans will, humans will fuck up everything, right? right. right. <laughs> 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 Absolutely. <laughs> But uh, yeah, and then I, we launched it in 2016 in Portland. Because um, again, I went to a few cities to see like, hey, I knew I couldn't do it here at that time. Because right. there was no market. So you know you gotta go out west. Right, yeah. That's another thing is you guys probably have more experience with the with the western markets than certainly any of any of we do. Um, so you saw that <clears throat> the appetite for something like this on the east coast in 2016 is not there yet with no, not a robust amount of programs intuition but out west is where it was now how do you go about i mean so if th this is your very first footprint in the industry how do you give credibility and how do you recruit because you have some amazing people at these conferences yeah. how do you convince them that your conference is the one as a leadership team we're looking at conferences right yeah. now and don't get me wrong i think the cannabis science conference is by far one of the best conferences out there but it could be a noisy market with more and more conf cannabis conferences popping up because business conferences Absolutely, popping yeah. up um how do you a differentiate yourself and then how do you make these contacts get these people to come yeah and i kind of always jokingly say that you could go to a cannabis event every day of the year and still miss half of them at this point you know yeah, what i mean no, like there's so many right. yeah, and we right. did half of them and this we, summer. we have yeah um <laughs> and you know i think there are a lot of great shows you know for instance i think mj biz is a great show you know they're obviously cornering the general business market um i think you know what sets us apart is again you know we focus on like kind of a niche market which is science and and medical um and we do have the three tracks so science medical and cultivation but we really just try to get to the science of all those things and you know for me to your other point like building personal relationships and friendships in this industry have been so um vital to what i do and like you know it amazes me sometimes that we have so many great people that like come to the show like dr ethan russo has spoken for us year after year in portland and you know the entourage effect and he, you know when he's talking to me oh this is my favorite show and like that means a lot you know when sure. people that like dr Deddy mary from israel they say it's like well, and you take care of your vet. You do. You take Thank care you. of your people. You do. Yeah, I will say that. like like Josh is saying, and I went. We went to the MP and I went to the one in Baltimore. Oh, Mary yeah. Pat actually gave the presentation, and like I was blown away just by the science and the medical. I mean, you're not going to walk in there and feel like you're going to a festival or something like that. This is really specific, and for us, it's amazing because it's hard to find stuff yeah. like that out there. And to be able to have the relevant people giving the speeches on the cultivation track or the analytical side, people don't understand how deep the cannabis market is in different areas and I think that your conference does a phenomenal job of bringing Thank that all you. to life. Well, yeah, that. and yeah. they actually know what they're talking about yeah. because you get a lot of speakers, I feel like, at these conferences that are just, it's a lot of BS and, and well, yeah. I'm looking at the person next to me and they're looking at me and we're like, no. And we really vet <laughs> our speakers and, you know, we do a whole, like, abstract submission process. So yeah, they, I, got you know, to see, I get to see that process firsthand as the yeah, doctor often absolutely, uh, yeah. applied and <clears throat> but you get hundreds of them, point, you know? Like, yeah. Or my earlier point, like, I honestly consider you guys experts in the industry, and I, I use that word very seldom because you guys have been doing it for four, you know, you've been in four years. Like, it doesn't seem like a long time, but we become experts so quick because the industry is so young, but that also means there's a lot of pretenders out there. There's a lot of folks that have been doing this for a year, a year and a half, and they've never actually ran a business, or they've always just kind of been hanging around a circle, and next thing you know, I see that they're on the panel telling me how to run a dispensary, and yeah. I know damn well they've never ran a dispensary a day in their life. Right. My favorite terms are um, expert cannabis consultant, a master grower. <laughs> Those are my two favorite terms of the industry. Like the throw around there, you know? And like you said, you come in a month later, yeah. oh, now you're an expert cannabis yeah. consultant. I was going to jokingly say I'm an expert. No, I'm not an expert. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and we try to be, I mean, we try to be as humble as possible. Right. <clears throat> and, and not use the expert term so much because I guess we're, you know, we're not experts, experts, but compared to our peers and compared to the resources sure. that are out there. I, I, we walked into a pharmacy the other day and it was like back to the future. I mean, it was, it was like, wow, we, we really are experts when we, when this is another healthcare provider and the level of knowledge and, and the ability for this person to eloquently explain CBD or THC or any of these other cannabinoid based medicine is not there at all. It does put us in a position where you, you feel empowered more than you would. Sure. If you bartended for four years, like, 
So I've been there. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't go around like an expert, right? Yeah. I wasn't a mixologist, <laughs> right. but in this industry. Um, and a lot of times, you know, for folks like us that are the, the common folks, we, we blood, sweat, and tears, right? Like, I don't think that you have 15 people planning your conferences for you. I could be wrong. No. But it's, judging by your Facebook posts, yeah. every yeah. conference I see, it seems like you're kind of busting your ass yeah. leading up to those <laughs> conferences. And it's a lot of boots on the ground. Yeah. We, I don't know if you know our story, we proudly uh, announced that we, you know, we wrote our own application uh, 100%. And we also came to market fairly cheap. And the knowledge that we learned because we had to write our own application because we had to do all this stuff ourselves, like that's what allowed us. We got our first consulting gig, paid consulting gig within six months of being open because we actually wrote our own SOPs. We actually did all this stuff ourselves. We actually had the IP. You know, some of these guys, they just pay a, a lawyer to, to write their, their application for it. They get approved and then they take all the, the credit for the, the application material. And you're like, no, I know that Mad Men wrote your application. I know right. that XYZ <laughs> wrote your application. Like... How are you now the expert? So that's interesting. So um, while it's on top of mind, my 80 day, um, thank you for bringing this conference to Baltimore for the first time, because I really love the fact that Maryland it seems to be taking at least a leadership role on the East Coast of the cannabis industry. You got Leafly putting offices in Baltimore. You look at Maryland's program has been fairly robust, fairly um, an example of what a successful state program can look like. And the fact that we were able to have a cannabis science conference in my hometown of Baltimore, right. Maryland, yes. was just like, Thrilled. I felt so proud of, of how far we've come. And it's easy to forget that like, Four years ago, you could be arrested for having, you know, it was just like a different vibe, little arrest, just like the public notion of what you're doing, right? I don't even know if the convention center would have rented to you guys 10 years ago. Probably right? not. And it's kind of a funny story. So, like, for me, it was full circle to come back to Baltimore. Because, like I said, in the beginning, we, we went out west. But in that time from 2016 to, you know, 2019, when we just did the show in April, the East Coast, like Maryland, but the East Coast just in general, like Pennsylvania, Delaware, New Jersey, like all these states were kind of coming on at least, you know, I call it like a me medical cannabis revolution because it was just like state, state, state. Um, and then for me, like being from here, and you know, it was really special and full circle to me to finally bring it back to the community. And we've had a lot of great, like Carrie and others from Baltimore that have been coming to the show in Portland since the beginning. But it's like, you know, your family comes, your friends that have been seeing what you do online, but they've not, you know, don't come all the way out to Portland. So it was cool. for you, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, absolutely. I, I really, I mean, um, I saw how excited you were when the billboard went up, right? Yeah. And I, yeah. Yeah, I, I resonate with stuff like that. I mean, for the, for three years almost, we were telling people in Salisbury that we were bringing something to them, but we didn't, there was no dispensary open. Like, And in, for a year and a half of that, we weren't even approved. Right. I mean, right. we submitted our application. We left our jobs and we were just in limbo. I mean, at <laughs> one point, I was bartending at the local concert venue uh -huh. um, and then doing like software sales and flying to China and doing all kinds of crazy stuff under the purview of like, I'm going to be opening a dispensary. Like you just wait and see, like right. Right. it's yeah. coming. <laughs> and now it's been open for a year and a half and almost everyone in the community has at least been, know someone that comes to us or Absolutely. so you, you kind of get this, this feeling of satisfaction in your hometown than more so than you do when in, in other areas. So I think that's gotta be an awesome feeling for you. And I'm happy that, um, it was a, such a success yeah. and that Maryland seems to be, uh, a place where cannabis is only going to be more and more robust and yep. uh, more, you know, being right next to D.C. and stuff, Maryland's got a lot of unique characteristics to it as a state. Our program's good, so I'm happy to see. And I assume next year, see. Yeah, we'll be back next year. And, you know, we have a great relationship with the, with the commission. And, like, it, you know, obviously having their blessing and their support means a lot. You know what I mean? And um, they were great. It's a, it's kind of funny, though, that when you were saying about the convention center, booking us or not booking us. Oh. We had our dates on reserve for 2020, and um, they were trying to, like, give them back, like, not let's have the dates, and they weren't, like, really being too clear on why. And I'm like, well, what's going on here? And they're like, well, there's another conference across <laughs> the hall that is a um, Narcotics Anonymous conference, <laughs> <laughs> and we feel that it would be improper for the two groups to actualize at the same time. No, and I said, you know what? Now. I said, I would love to have that organizer of that conference's number, because we should chat, and they should be having this content at their thing. Because I say, you know, right now it's federally illegal, but this can be 
an option for for opiate use and for other drug addiction. And I think that once it is federally changed, it's like a light switch. So this whole community is not going to know what to do. They're going to say, okay, we have this as a resource, but we know nothing about it. We don't know how to help you. We know how to give you methadone, and we know how to give you a Suboxone and all that. But The local um, resource for Wicomico County is a recovery resource center, and their executive director actually came in to our facility last week, and we had a a very fundamental conversation about how cannabis plays a role in in both recovery and even the uh, inpatient, outpatient process of getting them off of of whatever substance they're on. And once again, like these are conversations that I get really, really excited about because I know that cannabis has a place, but we need cannabis science conferences and we need medically applicable and mentally, medically fundamental training for these folks. Because if first off, two things, one is if you just throw it in their hands and they're not properly supported, it's probably going to be a failure. And the second thing is, is most of these uh, physicians and practitioners, everything is fed to them from pharmaceutical sales reps and uh, in a box with a, very easily instructions and three times a day and check give these four tests afterwards to test their blood pressure test this and you can be able to see these measurable differences and we know that there's no way to measure the endocannabinoid system you're not able to necessarily measure um through a a diagnostic assessment anxiety and things like that but we know that cannabis has a role in there so i think it's so important that um conferences like yours exist so we can get more practitioners we do more um trainings where they're able to get their continuing education credits and things like that so the physicians are better equipped because the truth is what we see today is a lot of the practitioners that are writing these certifications are not giving the greatest medical advice they're not um and more times than not they're not educating themselves on it it's just another thing to make money you know a lot of people you know what i mean like i will say like can care docs is great we work with maggie shout out to maggie we always yeah maggie love um, you and they always take care you know industry folks i know they have like some kind of special if you're an industry folk um i don't know if they still do that or not but yeah maggie's great i had doctors yeah they're amazing yeah um i had doctors and nurse practitioners reach out to me once they knew i was getting into the space and wanted to, hey, is there certain things that we can go to? And they were really interested because they knew that this would help some of their patients. So I think that, you know, it's just, but they're tied because they work for university. Well, and it's frustrating because these are people that are medical professionals and scientific professionals, and they're like frustrated that they're not learning about this. They're not learning about the endocannabinoid system. You know, that's something we've known about since the 90s. It's like, imagine any other function of the body that, oh, we just discovered a a function of the body. So like, we would know a lot more about it. So it's, you know, it's... it's, There'd be entire courses in school, medical school, dedicated to the endocannabinoid system. And eventually there may be, right? But as of now, most of these people just don't have the training coming out well and i feel like that's why it's been more accepted in baltimore because we have such an opioid epidemic and it's really i mean you see it everywhere it's it, like what it, is it, it gonna hurt to try everyone you know all I mean? walks like of life much worse. all families right. it doesn't matter yeah. and i feel like hey it really you're gonna like it's incredibly valid it's i cannabis. would say that the juxtaposition between cannabis versus opiates it's one of the best benefits the cannabis truthfully like if you, if you want to be as, as honest about it as possible because the straw argument that cannabis is this gateway drug and it's going to cause all these horrible things and people know that it doesn't but they see this pill that's being given out by physicians that's ruining people's lives it's causing it's ruining families things. it's yeah. that's literally killing our country and the honesty in people, they say, no, I, I'm not, you know, I can't, I can't get along with that. I can't believe that this pill is, op- the oxys are better than weed because they know, it, they know it's not. And it's to the point now where the, it is an epidemic and everyone has been, has been affected by it. If you tell me that no one in your family has, has a, has a, a pill problem or you don't know anyone, then I would argue that you don't know your family well enough right. <laughs> right. or like, yeah. it's coming soon because right. it's unfortunate, but Absolutely. like, <clears throat> the variances of people that get into these positions of dependency on opiates is amazing to me as well. Everything from the carpool mom that got in a car accident or had to have her L3 and L4 fused. And next thing you know, the doctor kept giving her pills and pills and then she couldn't sleep without them. And then she couldn't get up without them. And next thing you know, like she's got a dependency problem. And they're not having those conversations. Like we're going to give you this drug, but like you might end up being hooked on it and you might end up ruining your life. It's like, you don't, and they're like, Oh, it's written from the doctor. So it must be. I would see prescriptions come in that were written. Uh, There shouldn't be 360 pills 
in a three week supply for Vicodin at 10 milligrams. I, like, I just got, insane. this is a true story. I just got sick like a month ago. I got a sinus infection. And a doctor says, I'm going to give you, and I had pink eye, by the way. And I got eye drops <laughs> for the pink eye. I got an oral uh, antibiotic as well. And that's what he told me about. I go to the pharmacy. There's three prescriptions there. The last one, syrup, scissor, oh. promethazine. <laughs> He never told me he was prescribing wow. it to me. There was no instructions around it. For your and eye? And the only thing that came with a refill was a promethazine. That's unbelievable. Well, I was like, yeah. it's, I didn't touch it. It's right. still sitting yeah. unopened in my, in my house. But like, well, that's the thing. Addiction hits people differently. And some people have addictive personalities. And like, like you were saying, like you, there, you had no instructions. Some people try that and then they're hooked. Do you know what I mean? Right. Like some people, can, you know, take a medic, but it's like some people, it's like, that's what their problem is in our, in our society now is like, and it's all, even the street heroin that you're seeing that's an epidemic in Baltimore, this is all stemming from pharmaceutical use at some point. You know what right. I mean? Most, more than that. I agree. Um, I agree 100% because most of them would rather do pharmaceutical pills, but they can't afford them. So they go to heroin, which is cheaper. Right. And then f fentanyl is this weird thing where before they were trying to avoid it, but now they're looking for heroin that has fentanyl in it because it's stronger and it, it gives them the high more, but that's what kills them. It's, it, it's really sad when you see what has happened and when you actually interact with these folks and you see the human side of this, right? Like, it, we're not necessarily talking about a group of people in Baltimore, but you're talking about John and you meet John and you understand John's circumstances and what John does to get through his day. And, like, it's something. And then you know that cannabis has got all this research around helping this. So it's, it's one of the things that, that fuels uh, our drive for being in medical cannabis is knowing that we have a large um, – patient population that comes from the addiction community and they find us as an exit drug not a gateway drug and they've been a single substance user which is just cannabis for a long time and we have several patients like that um it's it's odd to me how many folks just use cannabis and cannabis alone um contrary to what this belief was is that well as soon as you try this you're going to want to try all this other stuff i was like that's actually not really what happens a lot of times they try it's this the other way and around they, they quit <laughs> swap the everything else stuff. yeah i mean i don't know well being both pastors preachers kids it's oh you guys share that in common yes. we do, yeah. and well and it's funny because my dad he'll tell his um friends like well maybe you should talk to carrie about cannabis <laughs> Because and he calls it cannabis now, and I'm like, don't you remember when you made me eat that? <laughs> yes, and he did. And they it caught was her with it, and they're like, eat this whole eighth. And, she did. and I got very sick. I, can I make it into a brownie before you? <laughs> so I know you. Oh, yeah. I did. I did the carpus first. Well, they were like in the you know reefer madness era, yeah. area, uh, era, and um, you know what my you dad. Area. Area. <laughs> but, um, you know, so my dad, um, he was the baby of uh, seven, and he was a, he, they were all moonshiners, my family. From so, the holler in West Virginia is where yes. people stem from. <laughs> so it's, it, you know, it's kind of uh, interesting. Um, I feel like it's prohibition now, right? now <laughs> yeah. you know, very, very much so. Um, but Can you we know, turn that sill into a CO two distillation center, <laughs> right? Some... And you were mad that I was smoking some weed, Dad. Really? <laughs> well, whenever I'm talking to like religious people about about cannabis, I'm always like, well, to me, I think that cannabis is the tree of life. So if you you know are familiar with the Bible at all, like they're talking yeah. about the tree of life, and I'm like, you know, prove me wrong. <laughs> you know what I, I mean? Agree when, uh, that, yeah. So when we were going through our search of where we were going to put our location, um, our very first identified spot was across from the local Catholic church yeah. and Catholic school. So I set up an appointment with Father Chris and uh, the principal at the time. Like I go through my whole spiel about, you know, we're medical and this, and, and my, the feedback was actually crazy. So the funny thing was, was the, the priest goes, well, look, you know, I went to college, so I know what a four-finger bag looks like. And I was like, oh, Father Chris pointed me. Like, I didn't mean to make you seem like such a novice. I didn't realize that, you know, you were familiar with this stuff. Um, He's like, I wasn't born a priest, you know. <laughs> exactly, right? He played football at Delaware, yeah. and he, he had a, a little bit of a life before he got into uh, the priesthood. But it was really cool that um, 
and he actually hosts the, one of the local NA groups around here. And he was like, look, no one's in NA for, for weed. He's like, they're coming here for alcohol, coming here for all these other things. And uh, there was actually a pharmacy that Mary Pat used to work at, which is across the street, Riverside Pharmacy. And to my, like, really made me feel good. But he was like, look, if Riverside Pharmacy can be there with all the stuff that they have in that pharmacy, then we have a fundamental reason and think that there's no reason why you guys can't be there. And then all the doctors in the complex that we were going to go in signed, like, a little petition and said they couldn't come in. So, like, I got Father Chris and the the Catholic principal on board, but then the doctors over there were like, no way with your devil's lettuce. Oh my like, God. the priest yeah. and, the, and the principal of the yeah. school. Like, I mean, I, I was doing pretty good here. No, so. I was just telling Carrie on the uh, way up here um, how, like, our connection, like, you know my cousin Kathy. Yeah, I was going to say, do we talk about yeah. that? So Angel, I, yeah. I was telling her, like, because Kathy messaged me and she's like, yeah, Anthony's like, how do you know Josh? She's like, that's my cousin. How do you know Josh? <laughs> and then she said, she used to babysit you. Yes. Yeah, for a long time. Yeah. That's uh, so funny. And shout out to Kathy. Shout out to Kathy and Ronnie. So and Ronnie. Her husband, Ronnie. Her parents. And Jamie, her sister. Her parents, Vera and Big Ron, <laughs> own the yes. skating rink. Oh, right? yes, the skating rink so, in Pasadena. Oh. So, like, first off, like, I was like the rink rat on Friday nights <laughs> and Saturday nights till midnight, like, hanging out there with them. You should have yes. a roller skating event. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. Cannabis friendly roller skating. When I was, uh, when I was like, skating. real, real little, like, they'd, like, close down the skating rink, put, mm-hmm. like, the Mickey Mouse, like, clubhouse music, and I'd have, like, the whole thing to myself. So, like, all my birthday parties were there. Kathy <laughs> Was, yeah, Kathy was amazing. She was a really, really cool uh, babysitter yeah. and uh, a really, like, I mean, a big part of my life when I was young. Yeah. And um, Jamie and, and Jimmy. Uh, Jimmy actually lives in Salisbury. <laughs> Hits me up from time to time. But um, that's interesting. And then Carrie and I have a connection as well as uh, my cousin, kind of, niece, um, is with best friends with your daughter and Juliana. Oh, Juliana. Oh, I didn't know Love that. Love you, Jules. Yep. Goes to <laughs> so, play soccer at Salisbury. Okay. I'm very accomplished there. So um, it's the cannabis community is so tiny and so small. It's really, really neat uh, when you start like playing the who's who game, like, right. especially in Maryland. Like you can typically figure out a couple people of ex-boyfriends or friends of family. or And it's also interesting like, the more people come out, the more like surprising faces that we start mm-hmm. seeing. And, I, yeah, I was going to say, there's been a few events um, recently that I've been to, and I'm like, before, you know, there's like a core group of people that started all together, and, you know, like us, all of us, and um, now I just see so many new faces, people that just want to learn or want to know or want to get involved. I have people hit, we have people like hit us up from high school, like. <laughs> oh I love like God. when you're, when you're non-cannabis friends, anything to do with cannabis, they send it to you on Facebook. I'm like, yeah, yeah I've seen that like, like 150 so times today. Probably the most quotable Josh Crosney quote between Mary Pat and I is, that's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. Like, <laughs> so often, like. Yeah. Well, hey, you know, uh, I picked on you in seventh grade, but my dog's got <laughs> epilepsy. What do I do? I'm like, look, that's not how this works. No. That's not how this works. Or my great grandmother lives in a state that has not, it doesn't have a legal program, uh-huh. right? And will you please help them? Like once again, that's I can't mail like. No, like and be ready oh, the, to can give you your mail? life. Can you help yeah. me? Can yeah. you find that? I'm like, well, I'm not a dispensary, yeah. but like, I can send you. I can right. send you to a doctor. Then you can go do that. And but, you, um, you feel bad, you know, sometimes because you want it. But <clears throat> it got to a point where um, it becomes unmanageable. And like, I appreciate that folks look at me as a trusted source sure. and that they want to help. And like, sometimes I find it endearing, especially with someone that I can help that's close to me. And but you can only do the best you can with your time and like you know, other times. All that. Yeah, I'm, I just want to respond back with like Google. Right. Just Google, Google it. Just Google it. You hey, because it it's like, turns out there actually wasn't someone there telling me all the answers when I figured it out. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> Especially us, right? Yeah. Like, it's like, what is this I, saying? Um, we were the, jump out of the plane and build the parachute on the way down exactly kind of thing. We that's did. the cannabis I mean, industry. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, literally. I mean, we were one of the first five dispensaries open. Mm-hmm. We opened as early as everybody yeah. else. We had no blueprint. We had no anything of, of what was going on. No one told us. We had a set of regulations that made no sense to nobody, even the people that wrote them, <laughs> right? And that's what we kind of went with. And you guys are the same way. I mean, nobody was doing the cannabis science conference before. Like, I remember calling packaging companies and they're like, you want packaging for what? Like, <laughs> cannabis? And I just hear the phone hang up on the other end. And that's all. I mean, at that point in time, like nobody was in it. So you got to, yeah. I mean, four years is an eternity in this business because that's how long it takes to. It really is dog years. Jokingly, everyone says cannabis years are dog years, but they really 
So in the last four years, how many state like do you you may not know this off your hand, but like you probably had clients in like a certain amount of states four years ago, and now you probably have. Oh, like, it's probably increased. Oh a ton my gosh! In four years, when right? the Maybe East like Coast, states, you think like eight or nine states within the last three years? More I more. would say yeah, even more. Well, and you work you work because, internationally too. With yeah, other, yeah, we do. So um, it was mainly like Washington, California, Nevada. Um, West Coast, Oregon, Colorado, yeah, Colorado, Oregon, you know, um, and then players. it, you know, East Coast, and yeah. it was just it spread the East like Coast wildfire. Happened fast, you know what I mean? It, it was really like this did. one, this one, this uh-huh. one, this one, this one. Um, and I think you guys do a really great job. And you know, shout out to Mary Pat, like because having someone like that and other people to really educate your, yeah. you know, your patients, because you know it is a medical market. They aren't customers; they're they're patients. patients. You know what I mean? And right. a lot of, um, you know, not, not to call anyone out specifically, but you know, there are brands that like operate more as like recreation, recreation, adult use or adult consumption. I always forget what the PC word for right. the lobbyist is, but I think adult consumption right now. Is well, always say like I didn't realize I was a patient until I realized I was a patient. You know what I mean? I'm like, oh, actually. That's medicine that I've been medicating with. It's funny. Well, that's, I, a, that's I, such a true statement. And yeah. I tell myself that so many times all the time. I'm like, damn, I always knew there was a reason why I was doing it. Now, yeah. it was always like, even like medical. my mother-in-law would call it my medicine. Like mm-hmm. way before, like, she'd be like, oh, yeah. just needs his medicine. Like it was, I always treat it like a medicine. Not, I didn't always treat it like a medicine. That's completely yeah. lie. I went through <laughs> yeah. evolution through college. Everybody else did. So you mean when you were doing like the blunt rise? Yeah, I was the medicine. Yeah, we turned a five gallon water jug into a yeah. gravity bomb. I was just going to say the no gravity bomb. Yeah. The gravity bomb. Um, when we built our our model, I came up with this like this fake patient, right? Mm-hmm. And she's 65 years old and she gets Lyme disease and she's never used cannabis a day in her life. If she can walk into our dispensary and we can get her through the process and make her feel at home and make her feel safe and comfortable and to tell her friends that she had a good experience, we can kind of cater to any patient out there. So it was always very, very important to me um, that we made this a, a really medical yeah. and patient-centric model. It was also... I mean, I did a ton of lobbying locally. I mean, this Salisbury is a fairly conservative area. Mm-hmm. I got a letter of recommendation from Jake Day, our mayor. I got the chief of police to buy in. And I sold them this this model that this was going to be a very patient-centric dispensary. And I think that because we've stuck to that, it's really been a catalyst for us locally in this area. Um, and I, we, can t- we'll, we will stick true to our roots, even if somehow adult consumption does come through. Which it will. Which yeah, it will. Which Absolutely. Will. And you know, oh. and that's the thing about can it's like no one can figure it out mm. like federally. They're like, oh, this is a medicine, but it's also this safe enough product to use recreationally. But like where do we put it? And for me, I feel like there's a lot of different things that could happen on the federal level and like everyone just thinks legalization is legalization, but there can be many different forms of what can happen. And- right. So like for me, like I was saying earlier, I work with kids, like can of kids. So like if the government was like, this is not a medicine, it's a recreational product and we're going to regulate like alcohol and that's it. The sick pediatric cancer and epileptic children that we work with obviously wouldn't have access to legally obtain it. Um, so, I mean, I'm all for recreational, but I think that we can always need to remember that this started as a medicine, you know, going back to the 90s in California with the HIV AIDS epidemic, you know, people like Dennis Perone, they fought and fought and fought for this. Um, and, you know, sometimes it feels like we're in this big corporate bubble and it just gets more, Which is more scary. and more corporate. Yeah. It is scary. And you mm-hmm. talk to folks like Jay and Riley and you understand why. <sighs> love Jay and Riley. They're like my, love them. And, and it was through them, my thoughts on legalization of cannabis have, have really it's been a huge evolution as I start understanding really how complex of an issue it is and you talk to Jay and Riley and you understand their huge concerns of Delaware goes wrecked before they get their medical program in check and how that could affect Riley as a patient and you start opening up and say okay this is really there's there's a lot of competing interests here I mean oh, sure. we've got to protect our patients right there's some social justice things that need to happen absolutely. around cannabis as yeah, well absolutely. so I, I look at this as a complex issue but for us when the all consumption becomes legal, which I agree it will happen, but I think there's a lot of ideas on a time frame of when it'll happen. Um, we're not, we're going to be it a could happen set. federally, but I mean, yeah. before it happens, I mean, yeah, you know, I really think, think we're close to something. Yeah. yeah, it could be a ballot initiative in 2020 for Maryland, I think. It's but I think, like, to it, that point, it's important to, like, not just be like, oh, I'm, I'm for cannabis. I'm advocating for – know, like, the specifics of what you're actually advocating for and, like, what – like, for Jay and Riley, like, what do they need to see out of this? Do you know what I mean? 
And it's unfortunate. I think one of our biggest downfalls as a cannabis community is we don't come as a unified front when we go That's to the, the federal biggest problem, level, yeah. right? Because you we look some, like a mess and all the infighting. I mean, you it doesn't have some look good. folks that social justice is there. Uh, that's what they care about, right? And you have folks that like Riley and Jade in there. Their biggest concern is going to be pediatric protection of sure. patients. Mm-hmm. Sure. You have all these different interests, and I think a lot of times for lawmakers, it becomes it becomes so noisy for them, and they, they see these 30 different bills instead of like maybe four bills or five bills that are very concise, and we start gaining some ground. So there, and it's because the cannabis situation is so fucked up right now. I mean, there are people that are going to jail for a medicine in one state versus another. Like I can, I'm okay in Colorado. I cross the state line into Kansas, and now. You, I'm arrested. Like, uh, there's well, and that, that's why the social justice issue is so important because we have a situation where the war on drugs has unfairly targeted uh, communities of color, and for the same thing that like now their you know straight white male counterparts are making millions and billions and billions of dollars. Okay. So like you know I know California is doing a lot of great work, and like you know obviously you know not advocating for violent offenders. You know what I mean? But if it was like a cannabis charge, you know you should have an opportunity to enter this industry. And it's like why wouldn't you if like I said, the flip side, your straight white male counterpart is over here in Canada or here or there making billions and billions and billions of dollars off a plant. Yeah. I um, you got the straight white part, but I haven't figured out the billions and billions of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> billions. <laughs> oh, billions. I, I like everybody else. I'm just paying taxes yeah. and, uh, and, and surviving. But no, I think, I, think it's a really, I think it's a really valid point. And I think because it is so complex um, and... The, the issues that face Maryland are some are different than like a Delaware. You know, I mean, like they're still trying to get well, maybe not Delaware, but think of somebody like uh, you know a state that doesn't have flour. I mean, they're still trying to get flour. They're still Virginia. They're still trying to make marginal advancements to their program. We're really going after some of the big picture things like 280E, um, banking, all those different challenges that we face at a national level. You think some of that would get pushed through, but. Even if something is, is a, I saw a statistic where like, even if something has a 90% approval rating with Congress, there's still only a 33% chance that it'll pass in any given term, just because of the way that Congress operates. So it'll be interesting. Just love that. Right? 90% of the country. You guys all failed. You all got 33%. Everyone's everyone's out. Yeah. Oh, it'll be interesting to see like the adult use. But what I was trying to get to the point is, is that once adult use does come, my my vision is that we're just a wellness campus that anybody can walk into. You don't have to go to this arbitrary person and get a card and then come to us. And I just think that you know some. It'll be interesting when rec comes because I think there's a lot of dispensary owners. I mean. Maybe a lot is the wrong word, but there's a number of dispensary owners that want to be a rec dispensary. Oh. They don't want to be a medical dispensary. They're a medical dispensary because that was the only opportunity they had to dispense cannabis. We're, you take you look at our DNA. It's never going to change. We've always been medical, led by Dr. Hoffman. We're going to continue to be that way. I, and I think there's a place for that. And I, I'm interested to see when they make that switch. If our patient population changes, I'm assuming there's patients that won't come to us any longer that'll just be more interested. Well, yeah, I always say there's like people like, you know, like for me, I use it to treat anxiety and like PTSD from a really bad car accident. So like we were talking a little bit earlier, like anxiety is one of those hard things. Okay, are you treating it? Is it better? Is it worse? You can't really scale it that way necessarily. But, um, and then there's people like, like me and others that like are using it for those kind of things. But then there's like the sick, sick people. You know what I mean? I think even when rec happens, I think there will absolutely still be a market for medical yeah, just medical, medical education yeah, absolutely, right. absolutely. Like that. I, I couldn't agree more and um <laughs> i always reference this as not being statistically accurate but my anthony darby scale of patients i believe that uh, <laughs> we have 20 percent of our patients that are direly ill mm-hmm. uh, without cannabis they could literally they could either die sure. or their quality of life would be sure. they'll well, be strapped in a bed and right? mm-hmm. not out the door we have 20 percent of patients that you can tell they're just looking for highest thc they just want to get stoned my argument is that the substances that they're using and, and possibly abusing at my facility are safer than 90 percent of the other substances sure. out in the world i think 60 percent, the majority of our patients are looking for a wellness tool They're looking for something that helps with the anxiety, looking for something that helps with aches and pains. They're looking for something that helps with sleep, helps with eating. These different conditions, if they lost it, their lives wouldn't end. Like my life wouldn't end if I didn't have cannabis, but I can tell you that my anxiety, my depression, these different things that I I challenge myself with every day, they would be so much worse. They were so much worse before we had a medical program. Even when I had street cannabis that I had no clue what it was, Mm -hmm. I had to basically spend my first (laughs) night of sampling it and just saying, okay, well, this makes me super stoned. 
yeah. so I guess I can't medicate in the morning yeah. like I normally need to do. Right. Yeah. I lose all my energy, all the and, and or, the, or, the, or the opposite of this is gets me racy. But what do I do at night now? Because if I smoke this, I'm going to be up till two o'clock in the morning on WikiLeaks or something, <laughs> <laughs> some kind of you know rabbit hole. Uh-huh. But <laughs> it's great that there's like so I, many. If you don't like to smoke it, you can take a tincture. Yeah, you can I, take I a pill. You, well, can you know the people that'll tell you like, oh, I tried pill. it once or twice, mm-hmm. and I didn't like the way it made me feel. I always tell those people that like you need to go to a dispensary and talk to someone that knows what they're doing and like work out what you're trying to treat or what you, what effect you're trying to have because there's so many different kinds. And like you were saying, you right. get it from the street, you're like, okay, whatever the guy with the neck tattoos brings you, like that's what you're smoking that day. You know what I mean? So it's not like, oh, I'll take Blue Dream and then I'll get an eighth of um, Girl Scout. You know, it's like it wasn't like that. So I, I always encourage, ne- not encourage people because I don't Mr. push neck tattoo, it on anyone. something that's high and little. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I need you that 28%. Yeah, that terpene ratio is not working <laughs> yeah. for me. Like, I'm going to need for you to, like, get come back so, with something else. This is why I'm pining, but I'm not getting yeah, that. Yeah, I'm not. Mm. <laughs> but, I mean, and that's how it's gotten. I mean, to your point, even, like, the trochees and things like that, like, I've, I've always kind of been a non-edible guy. Yeah. Um, but these trochees, sometimes if I, if I am, like, anxious and I want to go to sleep, like, it, it affects me differently than smoking. Like I, yeah. all these different methods of administration are, are really applicable to different things. And I just, I feel like we're in such a great time. Even Charles yeah. is over here yeah. uh, doing a little, break. little dabbing yeah. uh, yeah. exercise. Oh, I brought it back out. Like I'm a old six school. Th- I'm a bong hit girl. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, and she takes the thing where everywhere. Like literally like she <laughs> did. got the carrying case like, for it? Yes. I, <laughs> and you know what? TSA has opened my um, suitcase, but it's only because I carry a pound bag with like all my hairspray full size. Because when I go away, I'm away for like two weeks. So, you know, that little like tiny stuff you get at the store ain't working for me. So but you- they, they don't even... No. Chuck, no. And I appreciate that. No. <laughs> they, they, don't even, they rip Shout that, they CSA. cut it open because yeah. that's what they're looking uh-huh. for. They leave I had, everything uh, else. Be- before it was legal, I had some brownies on me and I was flying mm-hmm. from Philly to um, I think Atlanta. Mm. And as soon as I got out of the car, oh there's a dude with a dog. And I'm like, same team dog. Like, <laughs> come on, let me be cool. But it was a drug dog. It was a bomb dog. It wasn't right, a drug yeah, dog. Yeah. They weren't, they weren't they interested are, in right? anything that I was doing other than increasing my anxiety. Yeah, um, right. <laughs> But so, so it's really interesting. So, um, so you, with all these new products, you still flower in a bong is, is your go-to. It is. Dr. Hoffman's, uh, is on a similar route with a little vape pen here and there. I I like a joint. I'm like a joint guy. He likes the, yeah, he likes the joint. Are you smoking joints? I do. I mean, cause you know, you don't like the smell. I can't roll. Yeah. But it's not as bad as a blunt. No. (laughs) That's the worst. (laughs) Um, well, and that's the cool thing I, about cannabis now is that everybody has their own right. preferred methods. Oh yeah, methods, you got vaporizer, yeah. bong. Yeah. yeah. Well, and have you tried the um, their um, canagars? No. Have you seen them? Or okay, so it's not like a blunt. Like you only roll. It's like it's made like a cigar. The glass? No, it's a, literally like a cigar. Okay. But it's full of like a quarter to like a half ounce of weed. It's like this is like a West Coast thing. <laughs> got it. And then it's like dipped in you know yeah rolled. oil rolled in keef and then it's like and like you know what I mean when I say like you know you roll a blunt it's like a little like this is like it's made like a cigar like it's literally like so a, it's got the like same. it's like a cigar yeah. you, and like we had it there was an award show in Denver that a few of us went to and like there was probably like twenty of us in a limo and we we smoked it for like three hours <laughs> <laughs> like and, you brought it home and then too. I brought one home and it was I think it was like New Year's maybe mm-hmm. and I was with my friend Corey and Seth and like we, we we smoked the whole one the three of us and I just sat there and I looked I was like I think this is the most high that I've ever been in my life <laughs> and they were like wow really like they're like that's a big statement for you you know what I mean I'm like so are, well, you guys, are you guys both pretty much flower purist I mean do you um, you know I'll do a little dab here and there yeah, and I, we like a our little pens, dab will do yeah I'm not really an edible um you know, I do. You like sometimes. the control, right? Yeah. I find a lot of people. If I'm not going to say you said the anxiety, I feel a lot of people mm-hmm. the anxiety have this it makes it anxious to take a, to know you're going to eat something that you don't right. have control over. Like I feel one of the things I love about cannabis so much over alcohol or any other substance I've ever been is my control levels. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, a, my on, if when I smoke or use inhalation, I'm getting an onset within ten or fifteen minutes, so I know how I'm going to feel. Yeah, and it's. 
typically like not often that I ever overdo it with, you know what I mean? It just really works out for me. I was big surprised at how quickly I adapted to the concentrates. Mm-hmm. Um, the flavor profiles really got to me. Like mm-hmm. I've never smoked cigarettes. So I've always, I've never really loved the smoking aspect. I've mm-hmm. always been like a water filtered bar sure. kind of guy, but these concentrates, they taste so delicious. And like, oh, yeah. I just, and the fact that like, if you have a high tolerance to be able to medicate and get that same feeling like you did when you mm-hmm. first started medicating, it's really nice. Yeah. yeah well, I yeah. Really... And it's easy because you can be out and, you know, hit the vape pen and it doesn't smell like anything. And, you know, well, depending on what you're smoking. But, yeah. You know, sometimes it's like, you know, flu- fruit flavors or Or you're like me and Carrie like... on the flight and you like put your little hoodie on top of your- <laughs> have you guys done that? Yes, like I'm, I'm, you gotta do true. it really light. You, you know, it needs to barely nothing. Make <laughs> I, I mean, like I, I mean, on Facebook, I see all these people at the movie theater. I mean, like I apparently like smoking in the movie theater is like common practice now for a lot of people. And like I, I'm. I'm too egregious, man. I, I feel like I'd look up there and be like this huge cloud. <laughs> I know. Like, Your oh, head's in the sweatshirt. How's that get there? There? <laughs> I, uh, I, I blew smoke into a cup one time thinking that it would. That would help. No, I just had a cup full of smoke. I was like, I, was I never just, thought about that. I'll have to try that next time. <laughs> no, don't. It's an epic fail. Epic fail. So we have a friend who we will not name out loud. That's good. But she um, did it in the bathroom on a plane once. And the alarm goes off. Oh, and the woman's like, excuse me, what are you doing in there? Did she get the fine in all the whole nine yards? Or? No, no. They just, she was just like, you know. Oh, she know. played it off. She was like, I'm using the restroom. Yeah. Like, they were the ones that <laughs> were like. <laughs> I pulled that car to the hotel one time. Yeah. I was uh, I was there for business, so I mm-hmm. had the whole suit tie, everything there. And it was like 10 o'clock at night. And the guy comes up and goes, oh, the room above you is complaining of a, a weird smell. I was like, well, I have business in the morning and I'm sleeping. <laughs> shut, yeah. shut the door like put the towel in like, oh. <laughs> it's fun and like you know I was traveling for business back then it was like it was crazy to think about what a headache managing my oh, medicine yeah. was back then like the, the did you do the, the wet is, towel I was gonna say that's the towel. true side of a stoner would, when you like go into yeah. the hotel room and there's like the towel you the then towel. push it aside <laughs> as you open the door it's like yeah. oh put that back I did the towel I did the spoof Right, if they would just the have dryer more sheet. hotel windows that open, the, I mean, it's so frustrating. You're in a hotel, even with a view, and it's like, <laughs> or you get like a little crack, and you're like, <laughs> <laughs> Are there that many people trying to dive out this window? Like, I was always told that's why Atlantic City, none of the windows well, open. Vegas has stopped doing it too. Like, it's terrible. Like, I, 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 I like the um, Palms place, it's kind of off the thing, and they have like really reasonable suites there, and they have great balconies, but um, they lock them because I guess you know. It's and Vegas and Atlanta are like it's like you could lose your whole yeah. thing life. there. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. Life, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's why I always think it's interesting. Sometimes, like um, not cannabis specific, but I think it's interesting that a lot of like business conferences are in some of these places. And it's like, can you imagine being the person that's like, I have a gambling addiction, but you don't want to go to your boss and be like, I shouldn't go so, to, you know, I shouldn't go to this I, conference because I would say it might be trouble. I wouldn't say that I have a gambling addiction, but I used to be a very heavy gambler. You throw down a little bit and on I the got, table. Okay. I, got, um, <laughs> I, got, uh, I got a job at American Express. Oh, okay. And our first conference is was at the Rebel Hotel in Atlantic City. Uh-huh. And I was like, if this isn't a fucking test. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, you know, I actually went to a glass show in Atlantic City a couple of months ago, and uh-huh. I didn't even go into a single casino. I was proud of myself. But you're right. Like, it's And it's also interesting, like, how much... Cause we know a lot gets done in these conferences, but there's so much debauchery happening on in the background. Like We were just in New Orleans for the uh, one. Oh. Yeah. It's crazy. What conference it's was that? True. Uh, it was Mar- MJ Biz, so Maryland oh, Business Conference. Yeah, yeah, they, that's, um, that's like an interesting conference. Like, imagine how boring it is, like, the yeah. international poultry... I've been there. International poultry <laughs> conference is like... I mean, it's... These guys are nothing to do but try to get into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, New Orleans pulled us in. We participated <laughs> in, in, the in party. everything. In everything. Yeah. <laughs> it's a fun city. So, what's it like when you go to? So, MJ Business in New Orleans, New, Louisiana doesn't have any any. So they that are, is they that just, was interesting. Yeah, they just put they issued licenses though, I believe, uh-huh. right? Yeah, I think so. so it's coming. Yeah. Okay. Medically. Um I don't I don't are you guys familiar with Dr. Shonda Macias? Yes. Yeah, so she's I know she's working um in uh, Louisiana. I'm not sure. I, I, but I'm is just, everyone are you guys just all smoking out front of the lobby? Because I mean like oh, typically it's like well, everyone's yeah. pretty egregious with their yeah. use. And if you go to a state where they don't have a program, was like was the hotel cool was everyone just like don't ask, don't tell type deal? 
I mean, we don't. We just I've do ne- it. And yeah, don't really care. I've never. <laughs> right. like, you know, yeah. yeah. Sue me. Uh, <laughs> I think it, you know when you walk in and you just act like you. You're doing the right thing, yeah. you know what I mean? You're well, not making a mistake about it. Like, the rooms with the little with the balcony, you know what I mean? And everybody's there. So we were out there like we literally had like 35 people in this balcony. I'm like this and we were next to the Hustler Club. <laughs> so the Hustler Club, we shared a balcony so the girls would come out, we would see them. Yeah. <laughs> Solid. And we did we did go and visit them one night. Yeah. That's a whole other conversation. <laughs> That's a different podcast. Yeah, That's a different a podcast. podcast. Exactly. But keep us medically focused. Tell me all this great science you're yeah. bringing to, to the United States, not the Hustler Club. Yeah. Um, so before we get out of here, um, we've, uh, I mean, maybe we didn't necessarily do a proper uh, introduction for the Cannabis Science Conference. Give us the dates. I know, um, tell us some of the the big names. You got a couple of big names coming. And kind One of, really big Go ahead and, <laughs> and, and give your, your promo. Your, your yeah, of. no, absolutely. So anyone that's interested, they can find us at CannabisScienceConference.com on all the social media platforms, Cannabis Science Conference. Um, our next flagship show is going to be in Portland, Oregon, September 5th and 6th. I'm really excited that we have Olivia Newton-John and her amazing husband, John Easterling, that are going to come. They were come. just on ABC News, right? Yes, and 60 yeah. Minutes Australia. Um, and she's she's dealing with cancer for the third time, and, and he is like a plant medicine man. He grows her cannabis for her in their ranch in California, turns it into medicine, and, and treats her with that. And um, she's really, you know, become an advocate for this, you know, and been more open about it. And I think that, you know, celebrity influencers play a huge role in not just cannabis, but anything, you know, and I always say that, you know, their journeys or stories are not more or less important than anyone else's, but they have the voice and the following and the platform to amplify the message. And I mean, that's really what we're trying to do. Um, But yeah, so I'm excited about that. And then we also have like some great researchers like Dr. Ethan Russo, who's like, you know, the entourage effect and uh, Dr. Jewett from UCLA. She's this great um, researcher that's doing um, natural killer cells. Yeah, I was reading her uh, her bio. Her bio, yeah, she's amazing. Um, um, Dr. Dustin Sulak from Healer, he's amazing. Our patients I'm are familiar speaker. with that brand. Yeah, and, yeah. And I'm so impressed with his collateral, like his uh, supporting documentation, material, everything. Looks oh, really yeah, great. he's very, and yeah, very. Even their online portal. I mean, the, he's doing, he's doing a really, really great mm-hmm. job. Yeah. And then, like you know, people like Dr. Bonnie Goldstein, Dr. Patricia Fry. You guys probably might know Dr. Yep. Fry from here. Um, so it's funny. I always like those are like my two like pediatric specialists, and they're the different sides of the country. And I'm like, bring yeah. you guys together in Portland. <laughs> but um, yeah. So I would love for everyone to come and check it out. We'll also be back in Baltimore, April sixth through eighth of 2020 at the Baltimore Convention Center. We'll certainly be there for that. Hop in real quick. Mm-hmm. I will say I've gotten a lot of people ask me what they need to do to like get involved in the industry. I will say to anyone listening, make sure you go to the Canada Aww. Science Conference. Aww, that's awesome. It's right in our backyard. Mm-hmm. It is, I mean, I think you'll agree. Yeah. Like, no, the, it was phenomenal. The caliber <laughs> of, of speakers and presentations there and booths is incredible. It's not limited to medical. There's cultivation tracks. There are analytical tracks. It really is a super comprehensive conference that's right in our backyard. So mm-hmm. I feel like anyone who has any interest even medical professionals that don't know where to start go because you will learn so much in those few days of lectures just looking at what you're interested in the level of education that's given there is that there's nothing that compares to that means so much to me and and, we appreciate your guys' support and having you guys part of the show this year was was amazing and you know we obviously want to keep working with you guys yeah i think it i mean to have that in baltimore when when this just got to our state i think was so refreshing for everybody the biggest complaint i get sometimes is that people are like i want to go to all three of the tracks but it's like they're you know running that was my biggest complaint I was like, yeah, I can divide and choose. conquer, right? Yeah. Like, I'll go to this one, you go to that yes. one, and we'll all take notes. Yeah, but no, that does mean a lot, and I it love what you guys are doing. And, and yeah. I think just seeing the industry come together like that in a state that just got this program is really uplifting for everyone. Yeah. And I think it's there. I mean, the, even patients that were there. Oh, sure, was yeah. So incredible. Well, to we see our see. medical track really talks to the consumer or the patient, and right. you know, the analytical science track. It's like if you're not. Sciencey, it could be a little, whoop, you know what I mean. Some of it, but yeah. um, like I said, we kind of have something for everyone, and I'm just glad you guys liked the show. And it was so awesome. special for me to like, you know, bring the thing home. You know, it was great. And I think you know, for patients to get there, and even professionals that aren't in the industry yet to go there and see what makes up this industry is pretty eye-opening. It's not what most people expect. 
Um, I think most people think they're going to go to a conference <laughs> and black walls and hit these sit yeah. on couches yeah. and just right. getting high all day telling stories and giggling, but yeah. not at all. The amount of education that's offered there is unparalleled. So thank you oh, very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. No, that, that means so much. I think you really guys does. are awesome. Thank Aww. you so much. Thank you. Thank you guys so oh much for gosh. coming on. This is really awesome. And uh, I'd love to do a follow-up maybe sometime in between the next two conferences. Oh, absolutely. We can really dive into. I mean, honestly, I think we could do just an hour on your Baltimore show. Yeah. Yeah, I know that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. That, so um, I'm so excited. I am disappointed that you don't have cool shoes on today. I, don't I mean, they're not I too mean, bad. They're, they're okay, <laughs> but I've seen I've seen yeah. you do better. I mean, yeah, I'll I give mean, you like a. They're beat. not crystal studded uh, Louboutins. I'll give you no, that. No, they're but. not. Oh, those are cute. Do you see her? She's got a little. I will, uh, I will say this. So, yeah, it's the first time we've talked about shoes, and um, one of the first times that I actually. I think what, honestly, I think what prompted me to send you the friend request was, <laughs> and I'm dying laughing because knowing you now and knowing your personality, I can actually like see this, com- this confrontation go down. But I guess you were approached by a man of the cloth at an airport. Oh. <laughs> and this particular man of the cloth you don't know oh, had, that, that you had, had, a fairly, <laughs> had a fairly strong stance on your footwear. Oh, do you know what he said to me? He uh, said, you know they, they do they make clothing for men. And your response <laughs> was? And I have been in Vegas for seven days. So I'm like, on the seventh day, the Lord said, you better get up on my face. You know what I mean? Like, so what was your response? I kind of... I think, weren't they... Weren't, weren't they these are it was very Beach? young. They was like a orthodox, like, um, Greek, maybe. He had the... And you know, he was wearing like a gown and I said, really? I said, you're talking about wearing women's clothing and you're out here wearing a dress? <laughs> yes, uh, I thought it was something like, these are Louis bitch or something like that. <laughs> I said, it's Gucci bitch. Yeah. Gucci bitch, yes. And I was like, I was dying laughing. Yeah. And I was like, man, I'm going to send a friend request. Well, and it's funny because I was actually with um, Olivia Newton-John's husband and her daughter and, and son-in-law and like they were just like what just happened yeah. <laughs> and you know I'm from Baltimore so like when I get going yeah. it's yeah. like hard to pull it back so like right. it was one of those things so yeah where'd you guys grow up in Baltimore? Oh, I grew up in Federal Hill he terrified the California. you grew up in, you grew yeah, I grew up in Federal Hill yeah, mm-hmm. yeah Baltimore. and then my family Baltimore. moved to Pasadena in like high school when I was like I so where did you go to high school at? Chesapeake I went to Northeast oh you did? yeah what I year? 2000 2000 so what year did you graduate? Oh three. Oh three. Kids. Interesting. That's so funny. Yeah, I bet we I don't are. feel like it anymore. <laughs> That's so funny. Oh my god, I know, I know. All right. Um, so sign off, everyone. Thank you guys so much for yes, coming thank on. Thank you for having oh us.